Good morning. Let's sneak up on you. All right. Matthew 26. Kind of a uh, chapter. This this uh, chapter covers quite a bit of territory, and then we, in in, in a, sh- a short amount of time, because you know we've talked before briefly about how Matthew authored his book, very much sort of topical, right? Uh, it wasn't as if it was scattered, right? In other words, but if you compare the other Gospels, the same information is there, but one may be more so in a particular order as opposed to Adam maybe picking things out specifically topic-wise, you know, and focusing on those. And so sometimes when you present it, it's not as if, I, well, it shouldn't be, right? We're not telling a story here. We're testifying, right, of what's said in the Holy Scripture. So a lot of what you'll hear today um, may make you reflect back to the play we did, right, just a little while ago. The veil, torn veil. Excuse me. A good teaching instrument, absolutely. You know what's funny about that? I was sitting there thinking, um, and you talked to my Mike and Mark. You know, began putting this together. This is really funny because if you see some of these movies that get pushed into Hollywood, they get these great name and they got these great trailers, yeah, and then you go visit them and say, what, right? There's one recently, I, I can't remember the name of it. I believe it was Abraham, and I don't know, you all may know. And I said, oh, Abraham and Sarah, and I looked on there. Of course, remember, Sarah was a beautiful woman, but she was not, you know, she was 90-some years old when she had a baby. Well, <laughs> she didn't look 90 years old, isn't that to me? <laughs> I didn't see the movie. But anyway, there's a lot of Hollywood that's put in these movies, and I don't mean to say it, it's necessarily bad, but it is if it's wrong, right? So when Mike and Mark wrote this, I'm just speaking for Mark, you can shut me down in a minute. You know, Mark, Mike put this, Mike, they put this together, right? Based on, right, what the Lord gave them. And then throughout the process, right, Kenny, we began to, you know, think about our parts and what we're doing, and we began to sort of like, look, okay, let's, let's, and we tried to help, I don't know that it was good, but we just tried to help <laughs> Dramatic. <laughs> right, we tried to help through the scripture that we were learning. All of a sudden it became a tool. The, the um, play, we could have come in and just said, okay, just read this. Um, but it was a learning tool for us, right? To even push ourselves into the scriptures to say, now how did it happen? I'm guilty. I said, no, it's good. it was like this, I think. And then I said, came back a week or so later and said, no, it wasn't like that at all, right? And the only scripture told us the truth. It wasn't because we were happy about doing it one way or the other. So anyway, some of that is in today's lesson. I thought it was just really exciting. You know, so sorry for all that. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, is that right? <laughs> Don't let them remind you what they reminded me of last night. Yeah, she's not in here, Heather. Oh, golly. Oh she's like, oh, my Lord, are you really crying? She was. Amazing story. Okay, I'm getting off the base of the lesson. But anyway, some of that you're going to hear today, all that, uh, you know, great stuff, right? Because the story of Christ, no doubt, emotionally, thoughtfully, it's it, there's, a, there's a sadness about, right, what he he went through, carnally speaking, for us, but it was for us. It was for us. He recovered. He's resurrected. He's in the right hand of the Father. We're just waiting to go meet him. So, anyway, I digress. Sorry about that. Okay, today we begin. One one of the topics in today's lesson, right, is that Christ, as it begins, he's with the disciples in Jerusalem, and the Passover period of time or the Passover holiday to the Jews. That's a very important. So let me help you with that if you don't know. Okay. I 
feel like I'm boring you, but let me just go to this, through this process to share with you. In the old days, when Moses and the Hebrews were in Egypt, remember the various scenarios that God allowed Moses to, um, or God imposed on the, is, excuse me, the Egyptians in order to allow the Hebrews to get out of there. They were in slavery. Okay, just to say it in short terms. Well, through several of them, frogs and blood and all that yucky flies and locusts, you name it. Finally, God said, I'll send a spirit through the land. And if you don't have the blood of the land, Over your doorpost. The spirit will take the life. What? Of your oldest son? That included the Hebrews. Included the Egyptians. Remember, God's no fear of man, right? He just does what he says. And he expects us, even as Christians, to do what he says. Anyway. Long story made short, it happened, came through there, guess what? He took the lives, many children, including who? The Pharaoh's son, okay? That blood that they uh, washed over the, the, uh, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, over the uh, doorpost, right, was was the blood of a lamb. They They called that the Passover lamb. So when that happened, he, he, uh, excuse me, Pharaoh says, let him go. Now he didn't, even, he didn't regret it, but he did. He let him go. And Christ, right, in so many words, right, or so many short words, he became our Passover lamb, right? And let me get into that in just a little bit because this lesson we're talking about today is happening during what they refer to as the Passover holiday, which is several days. It's not just one day. But there is a Passover feast, specifically, uh, on which they're very, the, even the Jews, not only the Jews, but the, the Romans, right, and the Jews were very cautious about, right? Because they didn't want to stir up any negative activity during the Passover feast because it was a very, what I'd say, so-called spiritual time for the Jews. Okay? So this is how this begins. Any questions? Sorry. She starts so slow. But let me begin in chapter 26. And we'll go. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that we talked about last week, he said unto his disciples, he says, you know... That after two days is the feast of the Passover. The feast, okay? And the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Pretty straight and simple, right? A couple days is going to be the feast of the Passover. Son of Man is going to be crucified. Basically saying what? I'm going to be killed. Then assembled together the chief priests, okay? Then assembled together the chief priests, And the scribes and the elders of the people, the Jews, unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. Now, Caiaphas, interesting guy. In in some of the um, Gospels, they refer to him as Annas, as being the chief priest. Okay, Caiaphas here is referred to as the chief priest. Now, don't get confused by that. Obviously, they seem like two different names. Caiaphas is actually Annas' father-in-law, okay? Sometimes there's a period of time where they're even both, you know, fulfilling that role. But we're in Jerusalem right now. I think Caiaphas at some point, they kicked him out, right? They said, eh. But this point in time, they go to Caiaphas' palace, okay? Just in case you were big on names. And consulted, verse 4, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. Subtility means what? Trickery. Right? 
But they said, these are the Jews, the high priests, they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Right? Well, let's, let's, let's get this Jesus guy. Let's get him out of the way. We'll just kill him. Simple. And when I think about this, I, I'm sorry, I think of Jesus walking on water. <laughs> I think of the whole process that we're about to go through in this lesson of these guys thinking they're just going to walk up and put handcuffs on Jesus. And, you know, and he's going to, you know, I, I think of the power of God, right, that he had to resist if he wanted to. Would he not? This is part of the plan. This is, this is the Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled. Okay? They said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. If they take Jesus and do this uh, hostile work on the feast day, right, they're going to make some people mad. Because everybody wasn't necessarily um, contrary to what Jesus had done, right? There's a whole lot of people out there that got healed. What do you think about them? What do you think their thoughts are of Jesus at that point in time? Now, some are probably, eh, it was just a, I, I was just numb on one side. I, could, I couldn't walk for 50 years, but he healed me. Some of that, I'm sure, would tick people off, wouldn't you think? Okay, let's continue. Verse 6, it says, Now when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper. Now think about this. In Bethany, which is another little town on the outskirts, right, of Jerusalem. In the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat, meaning they were eating, right? But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? Now, based on what I read and some of the feedback I got in the lessons, whatever she had in this box, I don't know who, well, we do know who she was. I'll tell you about it. I'll point you there. They said there was almost a year's worth of income in that one box. we look over in John, I don't know if you guys, I'll, I'll jump there real quick. John chapter 11. I'll read this section there. See if these names sound familiar. John chapter 11. It says, now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. You ever heard of Lazarus? Right, the guy Jesus raised from the dead. Remember his sister, Mary and Martha? Remember Martha was the work, 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 work. Mary's worship, 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 right? Sir, man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and Mar Mar she's Mary and her sister Martha. This is in parentheses. It says, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment. And wiped his feet with her hair. Whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him saying, Lord behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Okay. So now if you read Matthew, it's not necessarily obvious. Unless you read the other scriptures, right? To get an idea of who this Mary was. Um, so I did not know this. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if the Sunday school lesson that was true. This Simon, this guy, Simon a leper. We've talked about leprosy before, right? But Simon might have been their father of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But regardless, that he is in the house of an individual named Simon. Mary is there, and she anointed him with this oil. Very expensive oil. Verse 8. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? 
So this ointment might have been sold for much, right, and given to the poor. Now, we know who the disciples are, right? And we know one in particular, right, was sort of responsible for taking care of the funds, the cash, right? You know who that was? Judas. Judas. I didn't say that particular verse, it was Judas that said that, in Matthew, but this ointment, this ointment might have been sold for much, it says, and given to the poor. And when Jesus understood it, as if he had to work hard to do that, he said to them, why trouble ye this woman, ye the woman? He said, for she hath wrought a good work upon me, for ye have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. Christ had just told them that in two days he'd be crucified. This is in red. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world in Christ, there shall also this that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial for her. I don't know what you take from that other than if what you got's worth something, don't don't hold back, right? If it's if it's a value for the Lord, give to Him. Verse fourteen. Now we start to to get into where I thought was. Very much similar to what our lesson was. Verse 14. Then one of the twelve, who's that? Called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest. So Judas, one of the twelve, it said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him to you. And they coveted, excuse me, they, yes, they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Now, first of all, everyone doesn't know what Jesus looks like. Right? I mean, maybe a few. At least the ones that got healed. Right? Everyone doesn't know who, how long his hair is or what his color is, tie is or his tunic is or what his voice sounds like. But Judas is going to let them know. He's going to work for a way to, in other words, to help identify Jesus to them for 30 pieces of silver. You know how much that is? It's about a month's worth of cash. Right? Now, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, here we are, the first day, we're going to talk about what they often refer to as the Last Supper. First day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat this Passover? Okay? And he, he said, Go into the city and to such a man. I don't know who that is. doesn't say. And say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at the house with my brethren. So the disciples Follow his instructions. Verse 19, the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now, these guys, they're a bunch of cooks, like kings. Big cooks. He didn't mention any women there. Didn't, it wasn't like at my house. Anything to eat? Is your supper ready? <laughs> right? These guys went to work, right? Prepared the Passover. Now, when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. So they're all sitting there with Jesus, eating. Christ just points out. He says, one of you will betray me. One of you will turn me over. Well, can you imagine? Now, we know Peter, right? Can you? We know how Peter is. He, he's, he's a hyper guy. He's a, he's a go-getter, right? 
He loves the Lord. John, they love the Lord. James, they love the Lord. And they begin thinking, could it be me? What's he talking about? How could, how could this happen? Verse 22, so they were exceeding sorrowful. Began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? As if he had to surprise them on so many occasions. He answered him and said, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Now think about this. They're getting ready to eat. And just to prepare you, kind of like we do communion, right? We sort of do that in reference to um, this. What's going to happen is to, to dip your hand in with means that you have an intimate, heartfelt relationship with this person. Okay? There's something in the structure of that sentence that, that means, I think that statement does not necessarily point out anybody yet, right? To the 12. So the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. Get this, Butch. Verse 24. Jesus said, the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. Meaning what? Prophecy said, stated all this about Jesus. He was going to go. And he was going to give his life for us regardless. No man was going to stand in the way. No man was going to stand in the way of Christ shedding his blood for our sins. But it continues. He says, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed said, it had been good for that man if he had not been born. Sounds pretty bad, right? Not that I want to, I'm not his judge, but it don't sound like anything this man do, did to betray Jesus. Uh, kept him from um, going to hell. Let's see. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? Judas by himself. He said unto him. Christ said unto Judas. Thou hast said. What's that mean? Bingo. You done it. You're the one. Hasn't done it. Well, he already has, right? You already know he has. At least according to the lesson. Thou hast said, and as they were eating, Jesus, guess what? Just continued on. It's like, you said it, dude. You're the guy. Let's continue on with what's important here. Because you're not going to stand, whatever you do is not going to stand in the way of what? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. As they were eating, Jesus took bread. Blessed it and break it. Gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. Right? This is my body. This is very common scripture, right, that we do every so often here in the church. We do communion, right? Jesus takes the bread, breaks it. He said, for this is my body. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Let me reread re 27. Read 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, break it, gave it to the disciples, and said, take, eat, this is my body. Now, this process that Jesus is going through, this isn't the first time these guys have had Passover. These guys have been Jews their whole lives. So there's a process in the Jews' home where they go through, right, the head Jew, right, or the dad, the granddad at the table, right? They go through this process similar to this. It is the first time that these guys have had gone through the, you know, the, the uh, action of being breaking bread or drinking from a cup. Usually there was like three cups involved, and they all had a different purpose. And one of those here Christ is going to refer to. You don't care about Jewish history. I know. But if Alita was here, she'd tell you that this is not just. You know, th even Jesus himself is following some Jewish tradition here in the Last Supper, right? Break it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, right? Now, he is giving them the very last, 
why do they call it the Last Supper? It's his last supper. It's Christ's last time he's going to eat right here on this earth. This is my body. He took the cup and gave thanks and, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Okay? For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, for what? The remission of sin. Forgiveness of sin. This isn't something these guys have ever heard, ever, at any Passover they've ever attended. I'm sure they've gone to one every year. Right? To go through the same process, but Jesus is delivering them a different bread, a different cup, and forgiveness of sins, right? Twenty nine says, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth with you. I just said, henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. With you in my father's kingdom. That was red. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Almost sounds like church, right? They just dismissed church with a song. And they went out into the Mount of Olives, which is basically just on the hillside, right? Over near the Garden of Gethsemane. Then said Jesus unto them, he said, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. This night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Now that's in uppercase. It's in red and it's in uppercase. Jesus said it, but it's been said before in Old Testament prophecy. So to be offended, what, what's it mean in this particular case, verse 31? When he's talking about being offended, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry. It, yeah, I am get that. I, I, I jumped too far back. Verse 31 says, Then Jesus saith unto them, he's talking to his disciples, he says, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. Seems weird, right? The way he says it, but it's just because of the way we interpret it. Yeah, yeah. They're going to stumble. Right? What's going to happen to Jesus tonight is going to make you go, know, or whoa. Right? Think about our play, Kenny. I may have you do your part here in a minute. Um, verse 4, Jesus says, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said to them, Though all men, here we go. I don't have you read this, Kenny. Kenny, why don't you read? Verse 33 through 35. Peter said unto him, They agree, right? It was with Peter. He's just his, you know, he just has a way of, he's a team leader, sounds like, doesn't he? Not, not me, Jesus. Jesus said, yes, Peter, you. Three times before the crock crows. That's like, oh. That's a, that's a humbling thing to digest. So the third, six, then Jesus cometh with them unto a place called Gethsemane. And saith unto the disciples, he said, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Taking the disciples. And he's got his little inner circle, right? Who are those? Peter, James, and John. I don't know if there's anything special about these guys, other than they were the first, right? But here he says, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. James and John, they call them the sons of thunder, back in the And began to be sorrowful, very heavy. 
So Heather, come in right now and get you guys attached. Verse 38 said, Then said he unto them, he said, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch for me. Remember when Kenny was over here asleep in the crag? He just went to pray, came back, and what were they doing? Right? They fell asleep. Christ said, What's up? You got it. Verse 39 says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. Okay, listen, this is Jesus. He says, Oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. What's Jesus saying? God, my Father. Who is what? Is Jesus not? Carnally? He has pain, right? He feels pain. He gets hungry. He gets hungry. He's liable to feel a little bit of a pain when they're whipping him on the back, driving nails in his hand, <clears throat> throwing the post in the ground, suffocating Ugh. on the cross. He went a little further, fell on his face, prayed, saying, Oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And he cometh unto the disciples, and finding them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, he's telling him, that ye enter not into temptation. So the Spirit indeed is willing Right? The flesh is weak, right? Sometimes we our carnal bodies overtake our spiritual willingness. willingness. Okay. So he went away again the second time. I keep saying Micah because I'm thinking, I think it is play while I'm reading this. And he prayed. This is Jesus. He said, oh, my father, if this cup may not pass from me except I drink it, what well, he said, thou will be done. If it may not pass from me, if you don't take it from me, that's okay. It's your will. We only, this is only beginning, right, about what's going to happen to Jesus Christ for the sake of our sins. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. He left them this time. Went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. He says, then cometh he to his disciples, saith unto them, Yeah, boys. Sleep on now. He didn't say get up, boys. I apologize. He did say, Sleep on now. Take your rest. Behold, the hour's at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. What is he saying? He's already, it's already happened. I've already been turned over. I just, they just don't have the handcuffs on me. Son of man has betrayed the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray him. They are in the garden of Gethsemane. <clears throat> and they get up with Jesus, right? And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a num, a great number, multitude, excuse me, with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now, it doesn't say Romans there, but, but Roman, the, um, if you're not a Roman, you're not carrying a sword. Okay? But they, are, but they do carry switchblades or something. We'll find out about that. Anything, can, what do you call them? Conceal and carry? That's what they are. That's what Peter was. Let's continue here. While he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. I do want to make this comment. The, the Jewish church, they had their own kind of like army. I say army, but they had a group of what they call, I call them security guards or whatever, right? 
tough guys or they probably guarded the chief priest, you know, get people from beating up on them or, or put them, you know, I don't know, I don't know what all they do to, to people. But verse 48 says, Now he that betrayeth him gave them a sign. Remember when Jude, in the play, it's fun, Judas came up and said, that's him. I'm like, wow. When I kiss him, he'll know who he is. That's what it says. Whosoever I shall kiss, that same as he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then they came, laid hands on Jesus, and took him. Now they're going to grab this guy, go walk on water, right? He heals the sick, bring the dead back to life. They're just going to grab him and walk away with him. Why is this? This is a prophecy, right? Almost done here. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus, doesn't say in this particular book. One of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck a servant of the high priest, smote off his ear. The guy's name was Malchus. And the guy cut his ear off of Peter. You see, can you do that? The play? It took him a lot of practice. Then okay. said Jesus on him, he said, put up again. Now this is you think Jesus is saying, oh, you just cut his ear off. Don't do that. I can't only imagine that coming out of the Lord. Whoa! He picked the guy's ear up, put it back on his head. Doesn't say that right here in Matthew. But the other scriptures, other, other, other gospels, I have time. We can read that. Jesus says, put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. He said, thinkest thou, this is Jesus, thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father? And he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. How many people, how many in a Roman uh, soldier army, a legion is 6,000. Right? 6,000 times 12, what's that? 72,000 or something. That's just a number, but it's big. Can I not just say, hey, God, hey, Father, call the angels. Get these clowns off me. He did. He went. After he put the guy's ear back on his head. How then shall the scriptures be filled? This is Jesus. That this must be. Right? That thus it must be. I must go. I must give my life. If you want forgiveness of sins, I must shed my blood. If you want a home in heaven, I must be resurrected. In that same hour, Jesus... I'm sorry, verse 55 says, In that same hour said Jesus to the multitude, surrounding people around, it wasn't just the disciples. Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? He said, I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple. And he laid no hold on me. What's the matter? What have I done now? You think he just riles him up? But all this was done that the scriptures, here we go, of the prophets might be fulfilled. What do you say? Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. This is exactly what's taking place in this point. Then all the disciples forsake him and fled. Was that scattered? Maybe, whoa, what's that? What's that line of my 
What's this mean for us? Don't look good. I'm out of here. Whew. Okay. Let's continue. This is just a lot of reading here. We're coming to a close. So if you bear with me, just try to imagine Jesus now. Who's taking him? And who's looking at him? Who's talking to him? He is not talking to Pilate yet. Remember when in the play Mark with Pilate, right? That was the next step, right? After he went through the Sanhedrin and they had their two cents worth of smack, smack, spit, kick, punch. Okay? They that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas. We talked about Caiaphas, right, earlier. His palace. The high priest where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Okay? I'm going to read quick. But Peter followed him. They all scattered, but Peter didn't. This Peter guy, you'd think he'd be like, he always comes back. Peter followed him afar off under the high priest's palace and went in, sat with the servants to see the end. So whatever's taking place here, Peter is going to be witness. Now the chief priest and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. So what are they saying? They're kind of drum, trying to drum up a story, right? Drum up some reason for which they could just go ahead and, pre- and by their law, what? Kill him or stone him. It's probably more likely to be the case. Verse 60, but found none, yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two witnesses. Now here's the key verses to this story, right? They said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple and to build it in three days. Now we know Jesus said that. Now what is he talking about? Tearing the veil. Right? So you can come in. Three days, the work I'm going to do is going to save your sin. It's going to make a pathway for you to walk, talk with God through me forever. I keep missing my place, losing my place. In three days, high priest arose and said to them, Answerest thou nothing? What is it with which these witnesses against thee, right? But Jesus held his peace. The Passover lamb. And the high priest answered and said to him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Tell me. And in red, Jesus said to him, Thou hast said. Doesn't sound like a whole lot, does it? He said, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto thee, here we go. Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting, where? On the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. What did he just tell him? Dude, I am, I'm him. I'm him. Now, if someone, you know, of all the things we do wrong, there's only one thing we know of for sure that's unforgivable. And that's just denying Christ, denying who he is, right? The one and only Son of God. Christ just said in your face, I'm him. Then the high priest Ran his clothes, saying, he has spoken blasphemy, this Jesus, this guy. He said, what further need have we of witnesses? He said, behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. He said, what thank ye? They answered and said, he is guilty of what? Death. He's guilty of death. They tried him here. Then did what? They spit in his face. Buffeted him. What's that? Beating? 
and he even got the Roman shoulder set. And others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ. Who is that smote thee? Meaning what? What? Who did that? I don't know if they blindfolded him or what, right, in this particular text. Okay. Last few verses. Oh, we're done. Hey, read the last few verses yourself. It talks about Peter. Um, and this is it talks more about the crow. crow. Okay. Man, you just can't get into scriptures, can you? It's good. All right. I'll say a quick prayer. Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, we rushed you. I'm sorry. Forgive us, Lord, for not being uh, uh, more obedient, God. We praise you. Help us to take these verses with us today, God. We know you wrote them, and we believe them. And uh, you're so great and good to us and so promising and hopeful. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.